Dr. Hawk, can you tell us about your journey with food and, and addiction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my journey with addiction is a is a long and multi splendored one, <laughs> um, and I it, I think it began and ended with food. So my first food addiction, my first addiction was food, probably at age nine or ten. Um, and I hear this a lot. You know, I work as a coach with clients who tell me very similar stories all the time, where the the very first time that they remember binging or they remember um, really getting into uh, junk food or any kind of food in some sort of excessive way it was around that age, 9, 9 10, 11. Um, and that was definitely my experience. I was a latchkey kid in the 90s, left home alone to fend for myself and uh, babysit my younger brother. And the, those afternoons were long and lonely and uh, we would watch TV and, and eat, you know, peanut butter sandwiches and whatever else that we could kind of put together that was super normal from the ingredients in the, that we had on hand. My parents, my mom in particular, tried to live a pretty healthy lifestyle, especially for the time. She was, uh, she had McDougal's books around in the 90s. She was not a vegan by any stretch of the imagination, but she had an awareness of what uh, a healthy diet was supposed to look like. She had uh, been familiar with the Pritikin program, done that a little bit. So we were we were better off than a lot of families were in terms of what we had around. So we didn't have Fruit Loops, but we had Cheerios. You know, we didn't we didn't have um, chips and cookies, but but we had lots of bread. We had lots of peanut butter. We had lots of these things that a lot of whole food plant based people now these are the things that kind of become the the junk or the equivalent of junk foods. You eat this really healthy diet, but you still have things like bread or crackers or cereal in the house and can get into that in sort of an addictive way. So I definitely did from a very young age. And then, you know, in my 20s, I discovered alcohol and alcohol was an incredibly more efficient way to meet the uh, emotional goals of my uh, um, of my overeating. So I, I believe um, that there is an emotional component to overeating. I think it's different for everybody and we can talk about how that shows up and what we're doing when we overeat, when we're compulsively overeating um, or undereating to that you know, as, as far as that goes, that can also affect a certain type of state change. You're really feeling uncomfortable in your body. You're, you're feeling like the feedback that you're getting from your body is, is uncomfortable, frightening, something that you don't want to deal with. And so the easiest way to bypass that is to gorge yourself on food or alcohol or whatever your drug of choice may be. So when I found alcohol in my 20s, that was it. You know, I was just totally hooked on that. Um, and I spent about 15 years of my life uh, binge drinking. Um, it, the My relationship with food continued to be pretty dodgy during this time as well, you know, kind of binge eating and binge drinking go together like peas and carrots, as, as Forrest Gump would say, <laughs> except no peas or carrots are involved. Um, and so I spent my 20s and into my 30s just eating a lot of uh, really unhealthy food, always uh, vegetarian. I was, I was vegan. Um, I've been vegan now for almost 20 years, but you know that doesn't mean you can't eat all kinds of chips and vegan pizza and vegan donuts. And there's a wide, wide variety of unhealthy vegan food you can get into. Um, and drinking pretty much blackout drinking every night until I got sober um, 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago now. Um, and after I took out the alcohol, um, my weight shot up um, quite precipitously because I gave myself permission to eat whatever I wanted as long as I didn't drink. Um, and so for the first time in my life, I got, I tend to be more of a a salty, savory, crunchy kind of person. But now when I got sober, I had a major sweet tooth uh, because that those sugars and that alcohol, I took them away and had to replace them. And so, you know, vegan ice cream and you know, every everything that I could get into. So gained quite a bit of weight doing that. And um, once I, after a year or two sober, was ready to look at that situation more seriously. And that's when I really found whole food plant-based and um, really rediscovered McDougal after being familiar with him as a kid, uh, rediscovered uh, Furman and Eat to Live and Michael Greger and all, all of these sort of ways of, uh, you know, thinking about how to approach a whole foods diet. Um, and it was just never a question to me to be vegan. I've just been an ethical vegan. I, I tell people I was born that way. I was just born vegan. <laughs> I just <laughs> always had that awareness. So, um, but food, 
You know, I will I will tell anyone who asks, it is so much more difficult to get a handle on addictive eating than it is to quit drinking. Um, quitting drinking was hard, uh, is full of challenges, still full of challenges now, but it does not compare to being food sober, to trying to walk that that thin line of really staying adherent to a healthy diet and not self-medicating with food when that's really all you have left as your as your available drug to change your state. So so that's where I am today. It's, you know, I'm still working that that program. It's it's something that you manage. It's not something that's ever one and done. Um, and I think people having that understanding of it and that relationship to the idea of this is a lifelong thing. You know, we're always we're in a food environment that is always going to be hyper stimulating, hyper exciting, hyper available. And so having a lot of grace and kindness to yourself for navigating that and for when you slip, picking yourself back up um, rather than an all or nothing mindset, I think is really key. So, Well, thank you for sharing that with us. It's just so refreshing to have someone on that's not, that, that is actually coaching and helping people that has actually been on the other side because there are a lot of coaches out there that that have not experienced yeah. what you have. And so it makes it hard. To, you can learn about it and I can interview you, but I can't know, I can't be in your shoes. Yeah. I, I feel, I don't know how do you feel. I feel that it's a spectrum yep. Yep, where right. some people are like, I can have a cigarette once a year and I'll never smoke again. Yep. I can have a piece of candy and you know, that's it. I, it can be right in front of me. I can eat one of those chips and, and I can sit, and, and not have any any problem with it at all. And then there's the people in the middle of the bell curve that, mm -hmm. you know, but then there's the people at, at the end that if, if it's in there, if it's in the house, mm -hmm. they're, they're going to find a way to get it, even if it's under lock and key. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I think that that, that because of that, because that there are there are outliers of the people that are you know on one side or the other that the people in the middle really they they can't understand how those people on the, both extremes how 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 it's even affecting them and bothering them because Definitely. you know or or how you know how it's a something that they they live in that way because it just it doesn't make any sense to them and maybe I'd like to hear um, from our Green Warriors if you have had any experiences with any addictions or food addictions, let us know in the chat. Uh, thanks said food sober. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, definitely. That's great. That's really great. Mm. Uh, love, loving to hear that, that, and I think what I'd like to do now is I would just like to start off with our game of true or false. It's time for true or false on be green with Amy live answer true or false to Amy's questions in the comments below and Amy will ask our guest for the expert answer. Okay, green warrior. What do you think about this true or false? Once a food addict, always a food addict. Okay, think about that type your guess. And as you're doing that, we're going to ask Dr. Hawk to tell us about that. Yeah, I think that's a it's a little bit of a trick question, just to give you a hint as you're typing your answer. <laughs> and I think you already uh, alluded to that with your your description of the continuum, um, because I think some people definitely have to walk a, a narrower road than other people. Um, I, you know, I kind of frame this idea coming out of my history with alcoholism. And I identify as an alcoholic to some degree, you know, if I go to a meeting, I'll periodically go to meetings and say, I am Jen, I'm an alcoholic, you know, I'll do that. But I don't think it serves me to think of myself as an addict and an alcoholic on a regular basis. Um, and I think that can be in for some people, again, this is all going to come down to individuals and your own path and what going on with you. But this idea that it can be really disempowering to some people to identify as an addict and to feel like you're, you're totally powerless and helpless around certain foods. My, that's not been my experience um, because I have watched myself with that, that food in the house, um, you know, even if it's under lock and key. There are times in my emotional life and in my relational life and when I'm going through something that that food is not safe no matter what because I need the medicine that that food is going to give me, even though it's toxic, bad medicine, it is going to allow me to 
avoid the things that I don't want to feel. It's going to, it's going to solve a problem for me that if I'm oriented to my life in a slightly different way and I have a better support system around me and I have other tools for dealing with things, um, I may be in a different phase of life where I can have that same problem food in the house and it's not going to exert the same kind of temptation on me. And I think people can relate to that where you've watched yourself throughout your life have times of life that are more susceptible to self-medicating with food and other times that aren't. That said, you know, there are some things that are so um, particularly tempting to me that I probably I'm not going to have them in my house just because I don't want to. Why make life harder for yourself? I'm not going to have my favorite beer in the house either, even though I don't think there's really any chance that I would I would get into it. Um, it's not something I'm going to choose to put right in my face all the time. So I have to exert that willpower and that that emotional bandwidth to say no to it because you only have so much of that per day to get through before you get really worn down. Um, um, and then something else gets waved in your face and you're more likely to, to get into that. So I think it's just about using that discernment and constructing your environment in such a way that doesn't, uh, you know, create this idea that you're you're completely powerless victim of your circumstances and you don't have any way to relate to it in a more empowered sort of way. Um, but also don't be stupid. Don't be crazy. You don't self-sabotage yourself. <laughs> um, and what that looks like is just going to be really different for everybody and depending on, on your journey, on your trigger foods, where you are with things right now. So it's really an individual path. It is such a complicated process to even unpack and much less understand. And I, I, you're the first person that I had ever heard talk about it, something, because we talk about food as medicine, but you're talking about a different kind of medicine. Yeah, and like chemotherapy yeah. or, you know, these medicines that are very toxic, but they do have an effect. It has the desired effect. It gets you, you know, I think about binge eating in particular, which I know, I know best. Um, nothing gets you out of your body and the, and the wisdom that your body has and the feedback that your body might be giving you about a bad relationship or a work situation that you are feeling terrible in, you're feeling that in your body. You know, you, you're getting feedback about how uncomfortable you are, but you can blunt that. You can silence it by beating it into submission with a binge. Um, and I think that 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 emotional component for myself and for a lot of my clients, especially my women clients, um, that is an important component of why it is that we use use food in this way. We use and abuse it just like we use and abuse any other drug. Um, and so, yeah, medicine, it's, a, yeah, it's a little bit of a, um, a controversial way to think about it because you are, you're, you're trying to treat a symptom and you're using an agent to, to treat that symptom. And it does what it, you intend it to do, but it comes with a lot of side effects. Um, and so you, just like you would use any medicine, with informed consent and and as little of it as you need um, judiciously, then I, I think it's important to have that understanding about all food as well, um, particularly food that you're using to change your psychological state. Yeah, doc, I remember hearing Dr. Furman say, "The greater the efficacy, the greater the toxicity." Yeah, that's very would absolutely apply just as well to vegan pizza. <laughs> <laughs> It's very <laughs> efficacious and it's very toxic. <laughs> yeah, and it's so misleading because, uh, for, especially for people who maybe have just adopted this lifestyle. Now, some people who are joining us may not even be familiar with the whole food plant based lifestyle, mm -hmm. which can be very helpful with food addiction and weight loss and, of course, other things like reversing diseases. But oftentimes we look to that label and, and, we'll just see the word vegan and it'll, it'll say, well, and it must be healthy. It's vegan. And, right. And, that, right. and that's, but of course we, we all always have Mr. Addiction that sits on our shoulder. That's whispering that it's healthy. Right. right. <laughs> it's vegan. Yeah. <laughs> what could be wrong with that? Same. I see people do that with gluten-free if it's gluten-free or even organic, you know, something um, I was I'm on the road and I'm looking for, you know, there's a, um, the, uh, um, 
engine engine two folks make a granola like a whole food ba plant based um, granola that's really very good. And I was looking to see if they still carry it at Whole Foods. I don't think they do. I couldn't find it. And I was looking at the other types of granola that were available at Whole Foods, and I didn't buy any of them because they all had oil in them. Um, and y some of them are marketing it as, but it's organic oil. <laughs> it's organic. <laughs> so now it's healthy. It's like this is crazy. This is it's 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 far from healthy as you can get. But the marketing goes a long way with things like that. So. Yeah. And it, and it just seems that, that our primitive brain is just looking for these ways to oh, definitely. Uh, give us permission to do things. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I think anyone who's had any history with addiction, you it's amazing to watch the brain. It wants to, um, if you're having a bad day, the answer is your drug of choice. If you're having a wonderful day and you want to celebrate, look, amazingly, the answer is still your drug of choice. You know, if you're bored, if you're overstimulated, it, it doesn't really matter what your state is. It's about changing your state. It's about this kind of predictable result that you get as a result of using whatever this, this agent is, whether it's food, whether it's alcohol, whether it's cigarette, whether it's coffee, it's all the same. And I also liked how you talked about, I did, I don't know if you used the word bandwidth or, or, or the amount of energy mm -hmm. that you have in the tank. Yeah. Can you expound upon that a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. I think of that. Uh, I had that experience a couple of years ago. It was kind of the la most, most recent time that I've had that I, I, I wouldn't say I came close to an alcohol relapse, but I definitely was going through a very difficult time in my life. And I was walking through a Whole Foods in Santa Rosa. Um, and I it was it was uh, Thanksgiving time. And so I was trying to get some food for a special Thanksgiving dinner for one, <laughs> just for me. And I was picking some things up. And I, I walked past all of these super normal foods. I walked past all the packaged vegan goodies. And I said, no, I don't want that. Nope, that's not healthy. Nope, I'm, I'm sticking to my menu plan. I'm going to get the healthy food because I want a special meal, but I want it to be a healthy meal. And all of those no's wore me down. And, and I got to this point where I sort of, after I'd said no, 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 the, the, my defenses were dropped a little bit and this little voice popped up in my head and it said, well, maybe to make it really special, you could have some non-alcoholic wine. Now, when I first got sober, I tried non-alcoholic beer. And what happened was I would sit there and drink the entire six pack at one time, trying to get that like tiny half a percent of alcohol by volume buzz that I could get from drinking the whole thing. So I knew that non-alcoholic is not really, it's like decaf coffee. It's not really non-alcoholic. There is a little bit of alcohol in there. Um, and I knew if I had it, then I would drink it in an alcoholic way. I'd be trying to get the effect from it. Um, but there was the voice, you know, popping up. And I really believe that that voice came about as a result of all of the no's that I had already said. I had, I had sort of spun through my defenses, um, just like any army, you know, how long can you hold off the barbarians before they detect a little weakness in your defensive strategy and they get, they get through the gate. Um, and now the city falls because they're able to get in. And the next thing that comes along or the next craving that you have has that much more power to um, exert its influence over you because you're, you've uh, really, you've spent your day without a plan. And so that's why it's really important to have that clean environment, to have a plan for the day, to not go into situations totally unprepared with healthy snacks or having a good meal beforehand or looking at the menu at the restaurant to kind of know what you're going to get ahead of time. All of those things are going to just, yeah, they, they eat up that willpower bandwidth. Um, and this has been studied by social psychologists and, you know, it's, it's a real effect, um, this kind of willpower depletion effect. Um, my colleague, Dr. Lyle, has a video on this called The Willpower Paradox, which you can find on our, our channel and probably just generally on YouTube. Wow. And, and I think about how I mean, you, well, they say that when you're, when you're an addict, that you're Push, your addictions are always doing push-ups in, push in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for you. But I also think about how we're, we're just oh, throughout the day, we're not even aware sometimes about how we're being bombarded with commercials. And mm -hmm. it wasn't just the things that were on display, but you were looking at maybe people with their shopping carts and their th 
full of things in their yep. shopping cart. Yep. And and maybe you were your primitive brain was like, well, look what the tribe's doing. You of know? course. Of course. <laughs> and everything's associated with a memory. Everything's associated with feeling better. Like I feel like crap right now. And I'm looking at that person's cart where they have foods that are reminding me of better times, better times, better social ecology, happier relationship, just happier life. And so, yeah, even if you don't, you don't have a big conscious awareness of what's happening there, that's absolutely calculating away in the background. Um, and it is wearing you down as you see those things, as you pass those displays, as you hear the music, as all of all of these memories and the smells and the combinations of things. It's just so much for us to to go in blind and fight our way through. Um, you, it really, if, if you are going to be in a more susceptible state than usual, which I was on that trip, it's it's very necessary to have a plan. And, and I, after the little voice that told me to get the wine, um, there was another little voice that said, you have to leave right now. You have to just abandon your cart in this aisle with everything you need to get out of the store. Because if you stay in the store and you think about it and you run that cost benefit analysis and you like you hem and haw, you you're you remember ghost when Whoopi Goldberg says you in danger girl <laughs> like you in danger girl like you need to get out of here and so I just left I just abandoned my car in the middle of the store and I walked out and I think if I hadn't I probably would have gotten the non-alcoholic wine and is that a slippery slope to a relapse I don't know I was uh, probably only five years sober then, four or five years. And so it was definitely a dangerous period. Most people do relapse. Most people, you know, your odds of staying sober are better by the year the longer you're sober. But those first couple of years are pretty tenuous. Um, and that was the first time I had really gone through a very tough time feeling very socially isolated, really just struggling. Um, and so I left and I went to a meeting. <laughs> and so that's what, you, that's what you need to do. Well, I've heard of so many strategies that I have never heard. <laughs> I've never heard of that strategy before. Just leaving? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you could leave other things, but you're in the middle of getting food for yeah. you, for yourself at the grocery store. This is the trip that we always go, oh, I got to go grocery shop. You know, and you oh, finally you get it, every, all the and, and, it, and then you yeah. leave. You yeah. know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, there, there, there might be a mom that their, their, their little kid throws a temper tantrum mm -hmm. and they're still trying to struggle going through yep. the store to finish shopping because they the best thing for them to do would be to leave. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But they but they know they just oh, I, ha I have to get this done. So, yeah. yeah so that's a that's a great strategy to add on to the list of, of things yeah. because they, they they say, you know, you just don't always have to eat. Right. You don't have it's not an emergency. I had food at home. I didn't need a special Thanksgiving meal. You know, I think that was my last I think it was like the day before Thanksgiving when the store was just insanely busy. Mm. Um, and so there's this, yeah, there's this feeling that, oh, I'm giving up my special thing and now it's going to be even sadder and I'm going to sit at home alone and eat like leaf side or something. But I think that's what I did. It was just like I had to, I just, I knew I had to get out of there. I was going to be in big trouble. And, and so, and alcohol, of course, is really... Um, if you're an alcoholic, it's it's much more life and death than um, food is. The, the, and that's really one of the problems with food addiction is that any given food choice is not life and death by itself. Um, and you don't get that immediate feedback of what a dangerous process it can be until you suddenly find that you've completely fallen off the wagon and you're, you know, you, you don't even know what you're doing anymore. But uh, it's easier to get back on than it is with alcohol. With alcohol, I always know, that if I relapse, it could be the last time, like I may never make it back. Um, so the stakes are different and higher. And so I'm more likely to act on a, on a little intuitive guardian angel voice like that. Um, with food, yeah, you, you have to do your best, um, but I probably wouldn't be as extreme with the food choice. Wow, well, that's a great strategy. And I, yeah. I hope that uh, people will put that in their little toolbox. Yeah, yeah there's no, no crime against leaving a cart in the middle of the store. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Carol Kowanski, I don't know if this is the Carol that I've had on my show. I would, if it is, hello. <laughs> uh, I, I think she's meant to say for many years, many years of 100% compliance have recently struggled with cravings of compliant foods. Oh, interesting. 
well, that probably means you're not eating enough calories. <laughs> if that's the if that's the case, um, I find. You know, I just talked to somebody the other day who had been doing a very strict whole food plant based thing for a long time, uh, a couple of years, and uh, and she, I call her my banana bread client because she she was really had lost the weight, was doing a great job, feeling really great about herself, and she walked herself into a banana bread situation, and she and she ate you know a ton of banana bread, and it just sort of opened the floodgates, and she hasn't been able to pull herself back into compliance, which is a word I have some issues with. Um, but she's, she's been uh, really struggling ever since. And we talked about it. And I told her, I think usually when this happens, it's because your body is trying to restore equilibrium from you eating under the hunger drive for too long. It's been keeping score. It's been saying, you're putting me through a, a basically a famine here. Like we're eating a lot of volume of food, but essentially not enough calories. And it doesn't always, it's not always apparent to us right away that that's the case because we feel satiated by the volume. And we're also, if we have weight to lose, we're pretty excited about that process. And we have a lot of adrenaline with that and it's very motivating. And so it isn't until you have your banana bread incident. Um, and she went back and she calculated that she'd been eating around 1,000, 1,100 calories a day when she was so-called compliant. Um, and that's just really not enough food for most people. There may be people with metabolic needs that are that low, but certainly she's an active person. You know, she's, it just was not enough food. And so her body, when it found some higher caloric density food, said, okay, jigs up, it's time to make up for what you've been depriving us of. Um, and we're going to ramp up those hunger hormones, we are going to compensate for what you've been putting us through, which is why I'm always coaching clients to take it, you know, low and slow, you want to, you want to have the smallest caloric deficit that you that you can possibly have and still lose weight to make this really sustainable for the long run. It's very exhilarating and exciting to do it fast. And of course, it works to do it fast to eat a very low caloric density diet. Um, but my my experience with myself and also with with my clients is that that almost always just bites you in the butt <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and keeps you in this binge restrict cycle that is so hard to get off of that hamster wheel when you're stuck there and and causes so much psychological distress and um, this the sense of total failure and uh, just all kinds of things that go along with that. So yeah, that makes sense. I go through that with my clients as well. And it's, I mean, even in this lifestyle, we don't usually promote counting your calories. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, you can see what you want to. You're comfortably yeah. full and you're okay. But sometimes that might be. And then, of course, we have different days, right? We, we'll have days that we might uh, have more physical activity than another day or stress, right? Mm -hmm. Totally. And that's something that... that yep raises the cortisol hormone yep. and, and gets us. So, so our, so our need for calories can definitely be different. I just want to say, Carol said, yes, the same one. Yes. Carol had an incredible weight loss success story mm -hmm. and, and she had been on the show and I'll try to put a link to our interview because she's on the show in the, in the show notes, but, and, but she said, my food is the same every day. So I'm getting adequate mm -hmm. calories. It is stress emotional eating. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 And that's, I mean, if, if it is the, the right whole food, plant-based food, you're probably not going to gain weight eating that food unless we're talking, you know, nuts or almond butter or something like that. But if we're talking potatoes, if we're talking, um, you know, sort of a starch solution, low fat diet, um, you're unlikely to gain meaningful fat from that. You might gain some um, glycogen and that might show up as a couple of pounds on the scale. Might be as much as 10 or 15 pounds for some people. If you've been eating, if you've been eating a low caloric density diet um, that's very heavy on the non-starchy vegetables and then you start to eat a bunch of potatoes for or rice, for example, I've seen people gain 10, 15 pounds just from the glycogen alone. Um, and that will freak people out. They're like, I'm eating healthy foods. I'm craving them. I'm gorging on them and I'm gaining weight like crazy. But that will level off um, and your, your, your dress size probably won't change that much. Um, this is just you know, it's water weight. Um, and, uh, but that if you, if you have been kind of, uh, not getting into that stuff and you start to get into it, those can be big shifts for people. Yeah. And, and, and there are many people that have, uh, noted that sometimes they'll recommend, Oh, if you're hungry, just eat a sweet potato. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's under the, the calorie 
range that you, you, you have to worry about and also that you would be satiated. But mm -hmm. oftentimes, there, I think, and that maybe now we can talk about the stretch receptors, mm -hmm. you know, because that, that may be something that as we're with this lifestyle, you can get full on such little little amount of calories. Right. But if you're a food addict, you really want to eat more, right? Right, and right. So you want to talk about that? Yeah, I think there's individual variation, again, between how people experience satiety and that some people are able to experience a really great sense of satiety with very low caloric density food because they have those sensitive stretch receptors and they don't have as many, you know, density fat receptors or other, other ways that they might be registering satiety. And that, that is an inside game. You have to know yourself, you have to know your body, you have to know, uh, kind of I, I, like you, I'm not an advocate of counting calories or counting macros or anything like that. But I do think what works best for most people is to get in a groove of pretty consistent food on a, you know, you're eating more or less the same thing or the same set of three or five things throughout the week. Um, and you, if you're paying close attention and you are attuned to those signals you're getting from your body, um, you know, some people are going to, they're going to feel a great, uh, the amount of satiety that they're going to get from a nut based dressing on their salad is so much more valid and valuable for them to do that, even though it's a little more calorically dense than a salad that's eight times as big with, with a balsamic dressing. Um, other people would prefer the volume of the much bigger salad for that calorie trade off with a tablespoon of like tahini dressing or something like that. So it's really, um, about knowing yourself, knowing how, what, what kind of a volume eater you are, how your stretch receptors respond to satiety. And I think that can change for people over time too, as they adopt the lifestyle and they get used to eating more amounts of food. I went to a dinner um, this week that uh, you know, was a was a whole food plant based dinner, but it was um, prepared by people who were not very experienced with what that means. So the portions were quite small. Um, mm -hmm. It was like five chickpeas on a salad, <laughs> you know. So, and I'm like, they were like, "This is about all I can take." <laughs> like, like a little cup of lentil soup that was just. And I was like, "Okay, so this is the appetizer. Where's the main course?" Yeah. <laughs> and um, so it takes time to get accustomed to that, to uh, not feel like you're going to uh, encounter or a bunch of social judgment for eating a large amount of food, especially for women who have issues with, you know, what, they don't want to look like a pig eating all their food. Um, there are a lot of different components of our personal and our social relationship to what we're eating. And uh, just getting really clear on what you like, what works for you, what, what is sustainable for you, what you're going to be excited about and feel pleasure from. These are such important things to discover for yourself rather than to you know, someone's program says to do this or someone's cookbook has this particular sequence in it. You really have to adjudicate these things for yourself as an individual because your, your body is unique. Um, it, you, you share a lot in common with uh, everyone else. And we know that a whole food plant-based diet is the way to go for everyone. Um, but there's a huge amount of variation even within that. Um, something like an eat to live Furman diet um, with a higher fat content is going to be a much better deal for some people than a McDougal type diet for other people. So just experiment and see what works. Right. I think that, and then I think that people just really need to, to think about the foods that they have that could be compliant, but yet trigger foods, right? Yeah, because totally. Then, you know, totally. I, mean, I we, there's, there's like a, a little joke that goes around, you know, you're not addicted to broccoli. Right. I, I, I don't know of anybody. There could be somebody that once they see uh, broccoli, they- I've eat. never seen it. <laughs> right. I haven't seen it either. So, yeah. but then, but then there are compliant foods there. That's what the term that people use. There are foods that are, that are acceptable to eat on this lifestyle that could be- Oh, absolutely. Right. Totally. Yeah. And, and, uh, and that's, and, and I think that because I like to listen to you and, and Dr. Lyle, and, and often you talk about the primitive brain. And mm -hmm. this is something that we really need to think about often because we're, we're walking around in this modern body with all these modern things around us. But think of something like a chimpanzee inside of you that's like looking for things just to get by. And, and that's all it's thinking about. It's not thinking about anything else. And, mm -hmm. and when, we, when we can't make the, the decision that we think would be right for us, it's it's not always our fault. And it's it's really hard to wrestle with that primitive brain. Do you want to talk about that? 
Yeah. I mean, this is the, just the essence of the idea behind the pleasure trap is this, um, you know, all other things equal, you're going to prefer the, the most calorically dense food in the environment because every single one of your ancestors for millions of years back into when we were chimpanzees, um, that, that is how they are surviving. They're not saying, no, 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 no. I don't want the tuber. I don't want the, the meat. I, I, I want the, uh, I want to eat some of these leaves off of this tree here because I'm on a diet. Like none of them are doing that. They are preferring the most calorically dense, the richest food in the environment, because that is going to contribute most uh, readily to their survival. The biggest problem all of our ancestors faced throughout our evolutionary history was starvation. It wasn't being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. Or it wasn't even disease or infection. Those things were serious harm. Um, they killed a lot of people, but by far what killed most people was starvation. So we are the species that is incredibly sensitive to a fear of starvation. And the best way to avoid it is get while well, the getting's good. If you see something that is calorically dense in your environment, you gorge yourself on that first and then you eat the twigs and berries. If <laughs> That's all that's left over. You don't fill up on twigs and berries and then we'll see about having the fatty organ meat later. Um, you, are, you don't have time to waste. You don't know where the next meal is coming from. And so you go for the, the, the most calorically dense food. What that translates to in the modern environment, unfortunately, is because we're surrounded by pretty much exclusively calorically dense food, manufactured, hyper-processed, hyper-palatable food is that's all, that's really all we see. And so we, we continue to gorge ourselves on that and we never get to the twigs and berries stage um, because there's always ready food in the environment that stimulates our nervous system and says, this is the evolutionary, evolutionarily successful strategy. If you don't do this, you're going to die. The famine is coming. You need to have extra fat on your body to survive that to continue to be reproductively viable, to keep the species going. Uh, it's a huge evolutionary mistake to diet or to eat diet food. Um, and the equivalent of something that is 700 calories per pound in a Stone Age environment, which would have been a very rich source of uh, nutrition in that environment, something like meat, something like honey probably would have been the most calorically dense thing. Maybe if we ran ourselves into a nut tree, although I don't know when when most people last actually tried to crack open a raw nut. <laughs> I have I have a lot of black walnut trees on my property here in Virginia, and they had a bumper crop last year. And you had to drive over those things with a car to get them open. <laughs> and even when you do, it's really hard to get the meat out. You know, it's really it's a process. It's very it's you're not sitting under the tree lazily just eating handfuls of nuts, um, let alone tablespoons of nut butter, which we can easily do now. Um, and that's, that's a compliant food, as you say, uh, nuts or nut butter, even if used appropriately. It's got nothing on vegan ice cream or even dried breads and cereals and, uh, you know, these things, these dehydrated things that hyper concentrate calories that are so easy to eat so much of with no water uh, to, to fill our tummies up and, you know, we're slathering whatever we have in the house, jam or hummus or whatever. Um, it's really very easy to eat thousands of calories at one time when we just wouldn't have had that opportunity or that capacity in the Stone Age. Um, so, yeah, we're fighting. We're fighting against instinct all the time when it comes to the pleasure trap. Yes. And that's something that a lot of people, some people may know about it, but maybe they needed to be reminded. But often when I encounter with my clients, they, they're they not familiar with it. Yeah. And that is a, we'll put a link to the pleasure trap in the show notes because yeah. I think that's that should be your first read. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Else. Definitely. Yeah. And Dr. Dr. Lyle has a good, um, if you don't want to read the book, which is a little dense and scholarly, <laughs> um, he has a TED Talk, which is also posted on our Esteem Dynamics site, or you can uh, search on YouTube, um, just called The Pleasure Trap. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. And I think about our primitive brain also. I think about how um, oftentimes when people are, are, well, I, I think that somebody that had came on the show, they said that there was an acronym that they used, and I think it was uh, HALT. HALT, yeah. yeah. Yeah, hungry, angry, what is L? Uh, lonely. Lonely, and tired. Then, tired, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they they had they they had talked about that, and, and oh, here it is, because I, I thought I tried to save it. Mm -hmm. So in case anybody wants to write that down or take a screenshot to remember, because oftentimes 
that this is what's doing us in, right, Dr. Hawk? <laughs> oh, totally. Absolutely. That's why I say that there's this relationship between our emotional state and how susceptible we are to these things. We're, we're always susceptible to them because of the pleasure trap, because of that primitive brain, because of the, the way that we've been wired for survival since time immemorial. But we're more susceptible at certain times than others, particularly if we're hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Um, and I, I think absolutely running through that and other tools that people can have to do a little bit of a self inventory really quick. Like, what am I actually doing here? How much of this is just a, uh, a habit? How much of it is, I, I really don't know what else to do with myself. Um, yeah, I would, I would definitely uh, add bored to that. Maybe lonely covers bored, but I think there's a lot of boredom eating. And it's, this is kind of avoidance of having to feel any other uncomfortable feelings. And so I'm going to go to the most palatable food in the environment. We're always from an evolutionary perspective, our, our brain is constantly asking this question, what's next? What's next? What's the most, what's the most um, constructive thing I can do for either my survival and or my reproduction in the next moment? Ideally both. Ideally I'd serve both of those goals at the same time, but it's survive, reproduce, survive, reproduce, sex, food, sex, food. Um, as Doug says, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's unless you're a male shark. <laughs> Yeah, it is. unless they say it's food, sex, unless you're male and it's sex food. Um, so it really is. I mean, if you if you strip it down to the essentials, that's kind of what we're always doing. And in those moments where we don't know where else to apply our energies, we feel kind of restless. We feel kind of anxious. We, we're just sort of agitated. There's this kind of feeling in our body that is uncomfortable and buzzy and we don't know what to do with it. Um, there, there's this feeling of, okay, well, I can go eat something really that's going to take a lot. All of my blood's going to go to my stomach. I'm going to get out of this feeling in my body. I'm not going to be reminded that I'm not using this time as well and productively as I could. I'm going to buy myself a respite from that. Um, and I think that can be an incredibly powerful force behind a lot of emotional eating. And if all we have in the house is potatoes, that is, you know, better than nothing. <laughs> and so those cravings for compliant food can often serve those emotional stress goals that we have just as much as our cravings for ice cream or whatever would. Um, and they're, they're not going to work as well. I always use the analogy of when I was a drinker, I preferred the higher alcohol beers and, and wines. I wasn't going to drink a 2% beer if I could drink an 8% beer because I'm going to get the effect faster. It's going to, I have to drink less to get myself tipsy. Um, and I look at food the same way. Like I can gorge myself on a giant bowl of mashed potatoes or something. It's going to subdue me. It's going to, I'm going to have a food baby. I'm going to be, I'm going to get a little bit of that effect that I'm craving. Um, it's not going to work as well or for as long as something higher fat, higher processed, um, that's going to take more digestive energy and knock me out of the game for longer. Yeah, what I'm really looking to do is just to escape myself in those moments. Well, let's talk about routines. I often, I, before I had this lifestyle, well, I there were some other things that I was dealing with also, but I, I remember, and then I remember also just knowing the other people went through this, they would go to the refrigerator, open it up, look at it, close yep. it, yep. walk away. 20 minutes later, they'd walk right back to the refrigerator. Same refrigerator. Yep. Nothing changed, right? <laughs> open it up, look around, close it. And it reminded me of how people say, please don't feed the wildlife. Yeah. Because yeah. They are going to come back. Yeah. And you won't be here. So do you want to talk about routines and, and what our brain does? Yeah, no, I think I think that's such a universal experience where people just open the refrigerator and it's like, maybe there's new information here. <laughs> maybe I missed something. Why do we do time. that? I don't know. Yeah, or, the, or the pantry or the, there's a story in my family that um, I always, when I go to my grandma's house, my grandma always had a, a, like exciting food in her house and in her refrigerator. And, you know, she'd have candy on hand, like in her pantry all the time. That was something we didn't have in my house at all, like maybe at Halloween time. Um, and so the very first thing I would do when I got to her house was open the refrigerator. <laughs> like, what do we have here? Um, I mean, I think this goes back to our ancestral imperative to we, we're just, 
you know, there, there is a, probably a little loop. There's a little circuit in us that our food environment could change that quickly. It, you, you don't understand at some level what a refrigerator is. You haven't caught up with the modern environment in so many ways. Um, and so that's just where you get your food. And it's like it, you'd be you'd be checking to see if any animals have ranged into sight. You know, we're out here hunting gazelles. Uh, we didn't see any five minutes ago, but maybe there's one now that we can we can start to track and pin down. Um, I, I think that's probably where that's coming from. The other half of it is just the way that we can get ourselves into a little addictive groove, a little habitual groove, um, just like, you know, and Pavlov rang the bell for the dogs, uh, they start to salivate. We can get into habits where, oh, well, it's four o'clock. That means this is time for my little sweet treat. You know, I'm going to have uh, uh, you, you just like clockwork every day. This is when you go to Starbucks and you have the coffee to pick you up and the cookie. Um, people will get into that sort of groove very, very easily. Um, and, you know, you you just have to kind of white knuckle your way out of those, just like you have to white knuckle any initial withdrawal from any addictive behavior or addictive substance. And it doesn't take as long as you would think that it would. You're, you're, you're going to kind of kill that correlation and that association within a week or so um, because your brain will get the message that this resource isn't here anymore. It's a waste of time to keep looking for it again and again. Um, and so you just really have to wait it out. You have to counter condition it with doing something else. Um, if people have a late afternoon or a late night sweets craving, which is super common, um, counter conditioning that with something like a really nice cup of tea uh, or another kind of beverage or something um, can be a way to you, you, you're still using that time. You're still using that correlation. We're, we're going to have a little treat for ourselves at this when the clock strikes four, but you can replace it with something healthier um, and not feel the same level of deprivation and withdrawal that you would have if you just totally took it away. Well, that's thanks. Had just said what foods are easier on the body if I want to eat oh, at night? Yeah, <laughs> so you're yeah. saying tea, like a tea. Yeah, there's there's a lot of really nice teas. I've I've um I quit coffee. Coffee was sort of my last uh, really addictive substance that I finally managed to quit last fall. Um, and it was a beast, man. I was like a you know two you pot a day kind of thing. Did I get? Oh yeah. yeah. All kinds of withdrawal symptoms, weird withdrawal symptoms. I had horrible nightmares. I had a backache for like a week, which apparently is a big thing. And what's crazy about this stuff is that they don't even know where some of those withdrawal symptoms come from. Like, like they don't know what the mechanism of the backache is. Is it your kidneys? Is it muscle aches? No one knows. It's just a, so it's a, just this incredibly toxic substance that we really should not be ingesting. And when I when I eased it out, um, one of my tools was this um, drink called Ticino, which comes in a lot of different flavors, which is a, it's usually made out of barley and chicory and flavored with figs and dates and other spices. Um, and it has, what I like about it is it has the sort of the weight and viscosity of coffee. So it's not like tea, watery tea. Yeah. It's got a, got a heft to it. I brew it in my, um, little pour over pot. And it's really a nice treat. It, it can, comes in a variety of flavors. There's like a pumpkin one and a snickerdoodle one and a mocha one. And there's just a million of them. Um, and they're all caffeine free. And that that can be something like that. I should really be getting kickbacks from Ticino for, for pimping them out on your show. <laughs> and, um, the Something like that can feel like enough, especially if you had it with sort of a healthy, like a date ball or something, if that's something that you can make and not eat the entire batch at once. So you, again, this is about knowing yourself, but if you made a healthy whole food dessert and you had a small piece of that with the tea, that could be something that would really work um, for people to transition out of something that is much more destructive. Uh, but you have to be careful. You have to not be you know, walking into that realm of making yourself something that is supposed to be a one-off little treat. And now you've got a whole batch in your freezer and you're going to eat the whole thing. So, mm. um, and, and I know that there are some things that are like that for me and some things that are not like that. I can make Kathy Fisher's pumpkin pie at Christmas time and that thing will sit in my refrigerator for a week and I'll just eat one slice at a time. I'm not really tempted to eat the whole thing. Um, and so there are desserts that that really work very well for me. But like I said earlier, I'm not I'm not a super sweet tooth person. So your mileage may vary, <laughs> but it's something <laughs> something to experiment with. Right. So here, thanks is asking about food because you talked about tea and beverage. Mm -hmm. So do you want to unpack what's, what might be happening with the desire to eat 
uh, foods at night and yeah. strategies. So, so that I would direct you to to watching Doug's lectures, Dr. Lyle's lectures on the, what he calls the cram circuit. Um, and the cram circuit is this idea that we are wired to cram. We're wired to cram um, at night, in particular, if there is rich food in the environment, uh, because you know it's it's this is our last chance. We might get killed tonight. We have to eat this food. Um, and the more you do it, and the more it becomes a routine, it becomes, as he says, a circuit. It becomes sort of a habit. Um, and so breaking that is like I just discussed, kind of a withdrawal process like any other withdrawal process. So it depends, I guess, what you're eating at night. I, I wouldn't worry too much about the timing of food if you're eating, you know, that that compliant food, that healthy food. If you're into something that really is calorically dense, that is not ideal to be eating at night, that's probably not the best idea for your sleep quality, um, for your weight goals. You know, there definitely is this chronobiological effect of eating earlier in the day, which is is beneficial if you if you have weight loss goals, um, but probably just in general, the the lighter the food you can eat at night, the the quicker it's going to digest, the easier time you're going to have um, detoxing overnight like you're supposed to. So fruit, you know, some some raw vegetables, that's going to be the best thing to eat at night. Um, but I'm not ever going to tell somebody if you're hungry. You know, a couple of hours before bed, go ahead and have the sweet potato, you know, have, have something. Don't, don't ignore your hunger cues for crying out loud. That's where people really start to get into trouble is, oh, the kitchen's closed. I'm in my fasting window. I really, I can't, I can't eat anything. Don't do that. That's crazy. <laughs> that's, that's making a deal with the devil to ignore a hunger cue. Um, so if you're genuinely hungry and a piece of fruit is just not going to cut it, something like a sweet potato um, or a small bowl of mashed potatoes or a small bowl of rice with some vegetables, like those are the things that are going to sit in your belly and ha help you feel a little more grounded to go to bed. Yeah. And then uh, expanding on the calorie restriction, perhaps for some people, they're, they're trying to restrict calories during the day. And then, then it's just that pendulum just comes to that full swing at night where it's like, okay, yeah. I can't take it anymore. I'm, I'm going to. Yeah. Yeah. Like I think that's so common, even for people who are not doing a whole food plant-based diet, but they're doing just a normal caloric restriction diet or a keto diet or whatever. Uh, you'll hear that all the time. Oh, I'm so good all day. But then at night when I get home, I get into all my snacks and I fall apart. And the, it, again, that's that combination of you probably were restricting too much earlier in the day and you probably have built up some cram circuits and some little patterns and habits and there's you're just used to doing it. So there is a, uh, there's an uncomfortable change to those habits, but you have to compensate by taking away those habits. You have to make sure you're still eating enough food and the right food. That's where so many people uh, really lose sight of the goal and they they get so excited about the caloric restriction part and they're just not taking care of their caloric needs and eating enough food. So if you're hungry, you need to eat. <laughs> you're, if you're eating the right food throughout the course of the week, you should really think of hunger, hunger and satiety and caloric goals um, happening more on the scale of a week than a day. So if you eat too much, we will say, oh, I ate too many potatoes today. You're not going to eat as much tomorrow, just naturally. Your body is going to now be more topped off with its glycogen tanks. You're going to have a little more fuel. Your, hu your hunger hormones are going to respond appropriately, and you're not going to have the same level of hunger tomorrow that you had today. So you're not going to systematically continue overeating on potatoes or on rice or on um, beans or carrot sticks, uh, th that will balance itself out over the course of the long haul, just like it does for every other animal on the planet, except for our domestic animals, who we also overfeed on artificial food. Um, but they're able to figure this out. And it's because if they get into a lot of really rich food one day, they're, they're not going to do that as much the next day. They're just not going to have the interest or the, or the drive for it um, over the course of the long period of time that they did when it was right in front of them. Yeah. And then we can, we can talk about habits. Probably a big habit for a lot of people is watching TV at night mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and being and, bombarded with commercials and yep, yep. so much to that. Right. 
And those things are so bundled with food. They're so, you know, it's it's such a cue to you're, you're watching TV, you're in this passive state. And when was the last time you watched TV without your snacks? Like most people just don't have even a sense of what that would feel like. It feels like total deprivation. Um, you're not even really interested in doing it if you can't have this whole routine that's built around it. And so that's where the counter conditioning comes in. Maybe instead of watching TV at all, you you develop some other tradition after dinner. You go for a walk, or you uh, you know you go out to do something. There there are ways that you can address that that just eliminate that bundled set of habits altogether. But if you're going, if you really want to continue to do some of it, and there's the strong cue to attach a certain food to it or a certain set of foods or habits, um, just experimenting with those counter conditions. What could we make instead? Could we, you know, instead of um, our cookie habit when we're watching um, watching TV, could we cut up a bunch of fresh vegetables and have it with some hummus? You know, these kinds of these kinds of things, which are going to feel really artificial and difficult at, at the beginning, like oh, we're subjecting ourselves to misery by eating carrot sticks and hummus. Um, but pretty soon, you know, after. Uh, I will tell people four days to freedom. Four days is generally, that's probably the average amount of time that it takes to really break the spell of the worst cravings. It's not as if you're ever going to get to a point where a chocolate chip cookie or a cinnamon roll doesn't sound like a good idea. It's going to sound like a good idea. You're going to, you're going to want it. It's going to smell good. But that that sort of supernatural pull that it has over us when we've been eating a lot of less than ideal food and we're, we're deep in the pleasure trap, that uh, very strong pull in that craving, a lot of that 90, 95% of that will dissipate after about four or five days for most people. So just kind of, you know, hold the line and white knuckle it and it gets a lot easier. Well, four days to freedom is very encouraging. Yeah. I, I would, I wouldn't think that somebody would say that in four days you could change a habit. And so, but, but you, but you can. And I think another, another strategy I like to share is, is not using your dominant hand. Oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, yeah. Just because you're, you've got this, I, I, when my kids were young, we used to uh, watch, they used to play this game called the Oregon trail and often mm -hmm. the, covered wagon would get stuck in the rut because it was yep. this long trail and there was the mud and it dried up and there were ruts from the wheels and, and that and you're talking about the the wiring to the brain and that's kind of what's happening and so if you can kind of go off the trail in some different way then well I mean of course that could become a new trail so <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe it might kind of just change circuits a little bit what do you think yeah, I think there's there's lots of research and evidence to support that that kind of like breaking up of uh, using non-dominant hands and just yeah doing things differently, driving a different way home from work, you know, keeping keeping yourself uh, in some sort of novel environment where you're paying attention to more cues and more incentives, and it just it just um, narrows awareness in a way that we we just kind of tune out the rest of the time. So yeah, I think that's an interesting area of research. Um, and for something like compulsive eating could definitely, if you're not using that dominant hand to reach into the popcorn, you know, you're probably not going to reach as often. It's, it's just a very, it's not as habitual. It's not as mindless. No. Um, so that's a very, yeah, that's, that's a interesting experiment. The thing I remember most about the Oregon trail game was that uh, 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 you've died of dysentery. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to say which one, but one of my kids, w w which was young, much younger at that time actually started to cry because she named the people on the Oregon Trail, she named them after family members. No. So one of them was deceased because of something that happened. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it, yeah, it was pretty intense. It was. It was very stressful. <laughs> Those early games you got very invested in them. Yes. So we have another true or false question. Green Warrior, true or false? If you're a food addict, you can never eat your favorite foods again. You have to go, go cold tofu. Cold what do you think? Type in your guess and Dr. Hawk, tell us about that. Yep. Well, it's another trick question. <laughs> um, and I think we've already really sort of covered this ground of um, it's, it's different for everybody. And some people 
some people really do have to go cold tofu. I think everybody probably needs to think about going cold tofu on their, their biggest trigger foods. Um, you know, I'm, I'm somebody who probably can never have a jar of almond butter in the house for any reason. That's just, that's just playing with fire. It's just really, it's going to take up like we were talking about that willpower and that bandwidth. I'm going to be spending so much time thinking about it and saying no to it and fighting it off that it's going to leave me really vulnerable to something else coming home. You know, what if, what if somebody brings by, oh, I have extra slices of, you know, cherry pie this week. And do you want, now that's in my environment. And what, when normally that wouldn't be a challenge, if I've worn myself down by thinking about that almond butter all day long, I'm just so much more susceptible to it. So it's the kind of thing that I'm just not going to challenge myself. Like why, why make it so much harder for yourself? Um, but I do think there can be a little too much of an emphasis going back to that conversation about uh, feeling powerless and, and like you're a victim of your food environment and that you, know, you need to have this really tight level of control everywhere that you go for the rest of your life or you're not going to be able to live a, a free life. I don't want people to, to be that disempowered um, across the board of feeling like, uh, you know, they're, they're just, they're kind of always on alert for a, a roving jar of almond butter that might come after them. <laughs> so you don't want to make it harder for yourself in your environment, but also understand that you do have a lot of sovereignty in your own life and you can make really good choices. And there are tools out there. We've talked about just the tip of the iceberg about some of these tools, but there are lots of other things that you can explore and uh, learn about and practice with to develop a better relationship to food. Well, you're certainly sharing so many pearls and I think you're giving a lot of people hope and I really appreciate all that you're doing for us today. So, uh, Green Warrior, please click like to show your appreciation for what Dr. Hawk shared with us today. And Dr. Hawk, please tell us about what you do and how we can find you on social media or wherever we can find you. Yeah, I'm, um, I am a refugee from academia, so <laughs> I just uh, work uh, independently. You can find all of my work at jenhawk.com. I have a couple of weekly virtual groups. I have a, a every Saturday, I call it the virtual village, where we talk about whatever's going on in life and the world. Um, and then there's also a Sunday group that is women only, which, you know, we talk, women tend to talk more about food and relationships and that sort of things, but sort of thing, but not always, it's sort of up to them. Um, and then I also have a, a food specific group, an emotional eating group called Enough. Um, and I have an intensive of that coming up uh, starting on March 30th. So all of those things or a personal consult with me, uh, you can find information about all of that on my website, um, jenhawk.com. That's the portal. Oh, well, thank you so much for letting us know about that. And yeah. You really do help a lot of people. And I really want to thank you, Dr. Hawk, for sharing your expertise and your insights on food addiction and navigating real food and, and real life, because that's what that's what we're all here trying what to all navigate. About. Life. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. And, I mean, your your valuable contributions, they really inspired my Green Warriors on their journey towards healthier living. And Green Warrior, what's your final take-home message? Please type it in the chat. And while you do that, I'm going to tell you that mine was four days to freedom. I like that a lot. Yeah. I'm going to be using it. And Dr. Hawk, Please tell us what your take-home message for our Green Warriors is. Oh, just never give up. Never, never. Like you, this is a this is a <laughs> more than a marathon. It's <laughs> it's like it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's more than a marathon. It's a life. It's a lifelong journey. Um, and I I don't want people to feel defeated at any point in that journey. Um, you know, I, I I have talked before, um, and I've heard this metaphor elsewhere. I, I I would give credit to where I heard it originally, but I, I'm not sure where I heard it originally. But that that we're on this very narrow path. We're trying to stay on this very narrow path. And it's very easy to fall off of that path because it's it's hard to keep your footing and it's like you're a goat trying to pick your way along. So we will fall off, but the water 
below us is very shallow. We don't fall far. It's just this tiny little drop. And so we always are able to pick ourselves back up and get back on that path. It's just really a process of course correcting, getting back on the path, not wallowing in ourselves. And, um, you know, this is this is very 12 step wisdom. You don't want to just give up and say, well, screw it. Who cares? Um, but but rather realizing you still have that sovereignty, you have that power, you have that ability to just start again and to keep yourself, you know, pick, pick yourself up with your big girl pants and just stay on the path and uh, keep keep walking for another day. Um, I think that's the most important message. Well, that was very encouraging. And a lot of us needed to hear that today. And I'm so happy that you were here to tell us about it. I also wanted to thank Jess Tass Voice. She did all the promos and she really helped get the word out about this broadcast. She did nice. the countdown and she's going to tell us who's coming up next. Are you struggling with brain fog, fatigue, shortness of breath, muscle aches, loss of taste or smell or other lingering long COVID symptoms? Join us for a discussion with Dr. Sunil Pai, where we'll explore effective strategies and practical solutions like dietary adjustments, anti-inflammatories, and effective treatments. Tune in live on Wednesday, March 27th, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, on Be Green with Amy Live. Thanks. And I also wanted to again thank you, Green Warrior, for joining us today. Your engagement and your support make these discussions meaningful and impactful. And we appreciate your time and we look forward to connecting with you again soon. And please stay tuned for more empowering content. And please remember to subscribe to my channel and share my message with others who can benefit from our discussions and check out Jen Hawk's website and give her some of your love too. And together as Green Warriors, we can make a meaningful difference in the world and as a special thank you, I'm offering you five free recipes. So all you have to do is go to begreenwithamy.com slash join, and I'll send them to you. And now we all need a little love today. So go ahead and take your right hand and grab your left shoulder and your left hand and grab your right shoulder. Now, please, because that's a hug from <laughs> me to you, Green Warrior, and to you, Dr. Hawk. Aww. I'm so glad that all of you were here to share this time with us. And if you would like to join me by typing in the comments as I do this with Dr. Hawk, are you ready? Dr. I'm ready. Hawk? Ready. All Let's right. do it. <laughs> well, until I see all of you again, remember be strong, be well, and be, be green. green. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Hawk. Thank you, Green Warrior. We'll see you soon. Thanks so much. It was great to join you. Looking for really tasty recipes that are SOS free? No sugar, oil, or salt. How can it taste good? Well, if you like flavor, then you'll love this Be Green with Amy recipe ebook. Get your copy today. Click on the link in the show notes. Be strong, be well, and be green.